Um, and uh, we are having a update for the Royal, Co Royal, Royal Component Societies. Uh, and we're gonna start with a, uh, a brief introduction from Dr. Pryor, our current MedKai president. Uh, Dr. Pryor, I will turn it over to you. Thank you. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Shannon Pryor. I'm the current president of MedKai. I'm an otolaryngologist in Chevy Chase. Um, and thank you so much for joining us. It's good to see both old and new faces today. Um, what I wanna talk about this evening is just briefly update you a little bit um, about what MedKai has done as a response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, hopefully you've seen our activities and maybe you've even benefited from some of our advocacy or some of our direct assistance. But right away, when the pandemic broke, MedKai began to send out regular email updates to all physicians, not just member physicians. Um, and these emails were daily for a while and then kind of became less frequent on a PRN basis. In addition to keeping everybody updated, the um, society and our staff have directly assisted quite a few physicians and their practices when they needed guidance in terms of applying for funds, in terms of what to do during the closure, in terms of liability guidance, all of these things. Uh, MedKai has helped hundreds of physicians and physician practices directly with responses to questions and requests for assistance. So that's been a really key role that we played and our staff deserves quite a few kudos for really being on top of that and working extra hard on the behalf of all of our members out there. We've worked and coordinated with the Department of Public Health and DHHS. Um, one of the things that was really quite successful was regular calls with Dr. Howard Haft. Um, and you may have gotten on some of these calls and uh, initially again, they were 5 p.m. on a regular basis and now they're they're, I think they're weekly now, but initially they were more frequent than that. Um, and just with an update and then selecting various special topics. MedKai was able to offer free CME for those who participated in those calls and they've been a fabulous resource for quite a few. In addition, um, we've maintained a website with information for all who have internet access. Um, and we have maintained information there on the pandemic itself, on physician practice resources, and also more recently on vaccination resources. Um, as you know, telemedicine jumped into the forefront. There were many questions about liability. So quite a few new issues came up that required a certain amount of advocacy and MedKai has been on the forefront and advocating for some of those things. And we've been relatively successful as Jean will tell us later. Um, some of our members who really took the lead early on were uh, Richard Bruno, who chairs our public health committee and Kathleen O'Keefe, who chairs the preparedness subcommittee. Um, just an example of some of the informational resources that we've pushed out. You can see just an example on the slide of uh, one of our emails with links to our resources page and to other appropriate resources. And then cycling through the next couple of slides, which we've talked about, um, we assisted with scheduling patient testing and sent uh, staff members to some of the local public health testing sites. We have participated in the process in terms of vaccine development and deployment, or not development, but deployment. Um, and we have uh, appointed representative to the state vaccine committee. Um, and we've been working on the plan and more recently making sure that physicians had the access to Immunet and CRISP that was necessary so that physicians can begin to receive supplies and administer vaccines in their offices. Um, 
In terms of telehealth, jumping in, MedKai developed a rather comprehensive coding guide to help physician practices as they implemented telehealth. Remote patient monitoring is another uh, development that kind of jumped into the forefront during the pandemic. And we looked at a number of different platforms and we continue to work on e-prescribing resources for our members. So as you know, many, many physician practices have, has suffered quite a bit and MedKai has helped directly with assisting applications for the CARES Act and the stimulus payments and the PPP monies uh, and additional grant monies. And again, we continue to be willing to help any member who calls with a request for assistance in obtaining necessary funds to keep your practice open and running. Um, that is most of what I have to say. I ran through that kind of quickly, but I'm happy to deal with any questions. Um, and, I, and I just wanna say um, that, that uh, all three of the presidents who've kind of been involved or maybe four actually, because the whole um, the whole issue has gone on so long. I guess we've been dealing with this for 18 months almost now, or at least 14. Uh, you know, Dr. Stallings, Dr. Manahan, Dr. Pryor, and Dr. Ma now, who's president-elect, have really been always available and very helpful and have done a great job. And, and I, one of the things I really uh, am impressed with is the ability for us to kind of continue to stay in touch to the best of our ability with Zoom and other things like this. I know it's not the same as seeing everybody, and I and I really want to commend our leadership for their hard work doing in this time and keeping things going. Um, also, I want to let everybody know this uh, is actually accredited for CME. So please do me a favor and put your name and email in the chat box. Or if you signed up ahead of time, you will get uh, an email link so you can fill out your form and get your one credit of CME. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and give a brief update uh, of, well, it's actually kind of long, but I'm gonna try to do it as, as quickly as possible. <laughs> but I'm gonna give you an update on health laws uh, that passed and the changes that have occurred. Um, and and uh, feel free to uh, ask any questions. Uh, maybe we can do them at the end, that might be easiest, but I'll go through um, this and then we'll go from there. Uh, it was a very different session uh, this year. Uh, this, the 442nd session, uh, had uh, hockey boxes uh, in the Senate to protect people, multiple sites in the House, and really everything was done by Zoom, which was very different from the prior years where we really had an ability, especially with the first aid room uh, and the doctor days that we would do and the component days to talk to people. We really, um, uh, we really had an ability to uh, talk to people in the past. And this year it was really about relationships and long-term relationships and texting and calling and working. And it was very different uh, from before. So the first issue and the big issue, the one that really uh, is the best one to start with in Annapolis is the budget. And the budget, what looked like was gonna be really bad and, and uh, difficult because of COVID ended up actually being somewhat good because of COVID. And I'm not gonna bury the lead here. The biggest issue uh, and probably our biggest win is we got $92 million in new money for Medicaid for ENM codes. Uh, this was obviously huge. This is the biggest increase in Medicaid funding for physicians we've had uh, in years. And in fact, it's more than what we've got in increases in the last seven years. Uh, this is going to significantly uh, increase uh, payment for physicians. So I don't want to bury the lead. And I think that's a big win. And the great thing about this is, is this is done in a way where it is reoccurring funds. So as long as they don't cut it, uh, it, it really becomes part of the base and that's huge. It's not like a one-time hit. Um, and it's for e &M codes, not just for one specialty or another, it's for all e &M codes and no other specialty was cut to do it. So this was a really big win uh, to get and that's the biggest issue. There were a couple other big issues in the budget. There was $15 million to create a health equity zone type program, uh, which matches up with legislation I'm gonna talk about uh, in the future again. There was language to study the Maryland primary care program, again, which is concerning and something we have to watch because clearly somebody has concerns and a few other issues. Don't worry, I'm gonna skip over some stuff, but we're gonna also share the slides with everybody. So if you wanna read more details on anything, I'm just not gonna go 
uh, into every little thing as we go through and talk about this. Um, I did also want to uh, point out, though, uh, with regards to the budget, uh, that there was additional funding for um, behavioral health, which is something that's going to be definitely needed uh, as a result of uh, COVID and all the problems that have occurred. Um, emergency legislation. Unlike prior years, emergency legislation is somewhat rare in normal General Assembly years. Uh, emergency legislation is a little different from what normally passes as it requires a three-fifths vote of the General Assembly, uh, and then the bill takes effect immediately. So uh, the important thing about this is all of this is now currently law. Uh, first of all, the General Assembly, because they've had concerns about the way the governor has managed some of the COVID issues and the way the federal administration was managing the COVID issues prior to the change, uh, they passed uh, legislation, Senate Bill 741, House Bill 836, that is gonna require uh, very clear reports and with collaboration with local health departments uh, with a two-year plan to respond to COVID-19 by June 1st, 2021. And that date is correct. Uh, they have to have this report done by June 1st, 2021. And then there's also an outline of how certain federal funds are gonna be spent. Um, it, it obviously things are somewhat better than they were at the time this past, but uh, there's still a lot of tension about some of the decisions and has things get made. Another emergency bill that passed was corrections and cleanup around the Department of Education and use of telehealth and school-based health centers. Uh, this was not really an urgent issue and had been bounced around in the past, but it became more urgent as kids were uh, kind of moved outside of schools. As I mentioned earlier, there was funding in the budget to pay for this new health equity or health uh, enterprise zones for those of you who recall from the past. Can I just ask folks who are, uh, let me just mute, there we go. I'll just mute them myself. Uh, anyway, if you're, if you're on and you're not talking, please mute yourself. Um, there was not only funding, there was also emergency le legislation that was created that set a framework. The Maryland Health Equity Resource Act is gonna create a framework uh, to div divvy up the money that was uh, created to do health equity um, uh, projects. This money uh, in the original bill was gonna be funded by the alcohol tax that was removed and general funds were used. Secondly, uh, originally the bill in, in thought there'd be a separate commission and instead they put this with the Community Health Resources Commission. There is an advisory committee in here and I mentioned this because it might be good for us to get a few doctors to consider applying to be on the advisory committee. The advisory committee has nine members, three appointed by Speaker Jones, three appointed by President Ferguson and three appointed by Governor Hogan. So uh, for those of you who are on the Ideas Task Force who have an interest in this, it might be a good uh, opportunity to try to serve. And if anyone's interested, please let me know. Um, there were several uh, essential workers bills that were introduced uh, that were emergency. Uh, the biggest one uh, was um, a little bit of a concern, although we took no position, we monitored it very carefully. The hospitals and the nursing homes were much more concerned and actually opposed it. Uh, that would have required a three hour hazard pay for all employees and paid sick leave was mandated. That bill did pass, but it was significantly uh, watered down and the $3 hazard pay was removed. So there is now increased mandatory sick leave for uh, essential workers uh, during COVID and there are additional protections with regards to essential workers uh, when a catastrophic health emergency is declared by the governor uh, but it doesn't go as far as the unions and some others would have liked. Uh, this is always a difficult issue for MedChi, uh, and we usually end up in a situation where we monitor and try to be helpful uh, to working out a compromise because we obviously have physicians who really want to make sure that they're protected and they get treated fairly in these situations. But then we also have physicians who are employers and want to make sure that there aren't mandates that make it very difficult to run their practice. So this is a difficult balancing act for us. Uh, as we move forward and work through it. Um, and I think we did a good job uh, participating in the discussion and moving towards a compromise that seemed rather fair for most parties and improve things. I'm gonna go through some of the other bills that passed that were not emergency, and I'm gonna break it down into categories. I'm gonna talk about uh, bills that kind of relate to boards and commissions, then bills that kind of relate to health insurance, and then bills that relate to public health. The order doesn't necessarily mean anything. It's just a good way uh, that we kind of manage and divide them internally and I thought it would be helpful. So first of all, and this was a MedChi bill that we were very happy to get passed, 
Uh, for those of you who aren't aware of this, uh, Maryland has a rule that if you're a physician corporation, the name had to be approved by MedKai and the board before you could move forward, unless the name was your name. So if you were going to start a practice called Shannon Pryor Inc. Uh, and you were going to provide ENT services, that would be okay with that approval. But if you were going to create a corporate name that said Best ENT Services in Maryland Inc., you would then have to go through this approval process. The problem is a few years ago, there was a Supreme Court case and a lot of you probably uh, have heard about or remember where the court held that uh, boards uh, like the Board of Physicians can be held liable for antitrust. This put MedKai and the board in a very uh, precarious situation if we were approving these things. So what we did was uh, MedKai worked out a way where these will still be reviewed by us, but if we feel there's a concern, we are gonna simply send it to the Maryland Department of Health who has a higher level of protection than the Board of Physicians to deal with it. This should streamline the process for doctors who wanna do something with regards to a name, but also puts a, leaves a check in place to protect them. Uh, this bill literally passed the last weekend before session. Uh, there was originally opposition from the Attorney General's office uh, who opposed the bill because it was originally going to be referred to him and they didn't want to do the work. They wanted the, the referral to go to somebody else. And when we compromised and went to the Maryland Department of Health, uh, he withdrew his opposition. So that was a nice, uh, a, a nice result for us. Uh, other uh, big what I would call boards and commission bills have passed is the telehealth bill. Uh, I mentioned this earlier, the telehealth bill uh, was a really big win for us. Now, obviously on this page here, you see there are two telehealth bills. There was one telehealth bill that MedKai actually strongly opposed that was put forward by the administration that would have allowed anybody without a license, you could, as long as you were licensed by a state in the United States, you could practice telehealth in Maryland. We had concerns about that because our concern was there wouldn't be protections for patients. It would be virtually impossible for us to punish a naturopath in Maine who was practicing medicine via telehealth in Maryland. And a naturopath in Maine is not required, for example, to have a collaborative agreement, where in Maryland, you're not allowed to practice naturopathy without a collaborative agreement. We were also concerned that you know if a physician in Alabama was doing something via telehealth and they weren't licensed, the state really wouldn't have jurisdiction over them. So we opposed that bill and that bill died. The bill we strongly supported with a coalition of a lot of different healthcare workers uh, was the uh, House Bill 123, Senate Bill 3, Preserve Telehealth Access Act. So just to give you the big bullets on this one, it pays for audio car, uh, calls, it pays for remote patient monitoring, and it continues telehealth post pandemic. So we're gonna have to do work on this though because some of the insurers are already putting prior auth requirements around remote patient monitoring, which is of concern. And the bill has a two-year sunset. So we're gonna to have to go back to Annapolis and fight to remove that sunset. There are studies that are gonna look at what we do as physicians and see uh, if there's overutilization or other problems. So uh, we really are excited. This was a major win for all healthcare practitioners from you know, behavioral health to physicians to everyone. Uh, but we have more work to do with regards to regulations and, um, and, and, uh, and making sure that the promise of what was passed is actually fulfilled. Another major issue that was pushed in this scope area, uh, which again, I consider a board or commission issue, is the uh, podiatrists were asking to be called podiatric physicians. MedKai has strongly opposed this bill uh, for several years. Uh, we've killed it for several years. This year was a little tougher. We actually were shellacked horribly in the House of Delegates. Uh, the full House passed the bill 99 to 34, and it really was very effectively portrayed by the legislators as a David versus Goliath issue. One of the other issues that makes this very hard to kill every year is the fact that uh, 36 other states allow podiatrists to call themselves physicians in one form or another, and the federal government does. So that creates a very difficult, um, uh, difficult situation for us to argue against. However, fortunately, with the help of Senator Mary Washington and Senator Clarence Lamb, they held the bill in committee in the Senate and the bill died. We will probably have to fight this issue again, uh, but we live to fight another day. <coughs> uh, another major issue that we dealt with this year was tort immunity. Uh, we were working in partnership with the Maryland Hospital Association to expand 
uh, immunity for practitioners during COVID. Uh, as Dr. Pryor mentioned in her presentation about the things we've done for COVID, MedKai was very successful in working with the governor to get an expansive immunity protection during COVID. Uh, there's a very clear order that was written as expansively as was legally defensible. We felt it would make sense to expand uh, this immunity further. The General Assembly did not agree with us. We could not even get a vote on this bill in either the House or the Senate. Uh, and we have an issue brewing on tort. Uh, the General Assembly generally is really uh, sympathetic to the trial lawyer's arguments that patients deserve um, uh, more recourse when there's a, a bad outcome. And this is something we're gonna be dealing with going forward and is a big risk to uh, physicians uh, and the healthcare community generally in Maryland. And not winning on this was a big deal, uh, frankly, for the hospitals and for physicians in Maryland. Uh, additional scope of practice issues we dealt with. Um, the, farm, the naturopaths tried to uh, prescribe pharma drugs. We killed that bill. The pharmacists wanted to switch lower cost drugs. Uh, this is a unique situation where occasionally the brand drug is cheaper than the generic drug. Uh, and we actually were not opposed to the switching. We just wanted to make sure that it was done with the knowledge and consent of the physician. So once we got that fixed, that bill passed and we were acceptable with it. Uh, and then the pharmacists want to order their own lab tests and we killed that bill uh, because that was again, an unacceptable uh, scope of practice issue. Um, genetic counselors uh, bill that has been in front of the General Assembly several years in a row finally passed. Uh, genetic counselors will now be licensed in Maryland and MedKai supported that idea. Um, and the language that we required that they have to work with physicians uh, and that they could clearly not diagnose or treat illness uh, uh, was included in the language. Um, genetic counselors will become effective in January of 2024. And the reason for the late date was the realization that setting up some new structure like this could not be done during COVID and we needed to get beyond that. Um, so but that was a, this was a result that we were somewhat happy with and it's uh, not uncommon to what's happening in, in other states across the country. Um, Workplace violence peace orders uh, legislation passed. This has been an ongoing issue where we've had emergency room doctors and others who have faced very dangerous situation from patients. This authorized an employer to file a petition for a peace order on behalf of an employee. Uh, this legislation requires the employer to talk to the employee before they file the peace order. So uh, that means if you don't want it to happen, you can tell the employer, please don't do that. The other thing that I wanna give the house uh, credit, um, and this maybe also speaks to the problem we have with regards to the lawyers, the language includes immunity. The bill, the final bill includes immunity. Well, the Senate did not want to put the immunity provisions in around this for the employers who would file these peace orders uh, and the House did. Luckily, in this case, the House won out, but I think it shows uh, how much trouble we have on these civil liability issues and how the makeup of the General Assembly is not favorable on these issues for us. Uh, this is a good bill though, and really does help us. And we luckily did win on this and the immunity provision is in there. So an employer, you know, a hospital will not have to worry about filing suit uh, if a nurse is attacked by a patient and there needs to be a, a peace order uh, put in place. Uh, so that's a positive. Um, a technical change to the medical records passed, essentially saying if the request was for a denial of a social security, security disability claim, uh, they would not have to pay for the medical records. Um, that, that bill, we had some concerns with it. Originally, it was gonna be much, much broader and our lobbyists effectively uh, scoped it down to just the problem in place um, and just this one particular issue. It does allow for one copy. So uh, with regards to health insurance, which is the next major area of healthcare legislation, uh, there were very few bills introduced this year and I think a lot of that had to do with COVID, but there were some big and some important ones. And I think the most important one is one that there's a large task force and looking on the, the Zoom screen here, I see several people who've signed up to be on it. Care First had legislation allowing for physicians to enter into risk contracts. MedKai strongly opposed this bill and was very, very concerned about these types of arrangements. The bill was withdrawn and we were successful in killing it. Um, we do believe in value-based payment and we have no problem talking about that. Uh, as a result of the withdrawal, uh, six leaders in the Senate and the House, Shane Pendergrass, Dolores Kelly, 
Cam Bidle, Bonnie Cullison, Brian Feldman, and um, Josh Lampagna Melnick sent us a letter and sent Care First a letter asking us to work with the Maryland Hospital Association and Care First uh, collaboratively to try to reach a compromise piece of legislation that had adequate patient and physician protections where we feel comfortable. Those discussions are ongoing and it's gonna be a lot of work. Um, we're hopeful that we can end up with something that's acceptable as we go through with it. A couple other insurance issues that were addressed. Um, the, there was a repeal of a prohibition on vending machine sales for drugs. Uh, the, in other states you see these, Maryland was one of the few states that had a ban on them where someone might have a pharma dispensing unit within a physician office or an urgent care office. Uh, there was an attempt uh, by some primary care docs to have uh, direct primary care agreements. Uh, that has been in before and that has failed. Um, and there are a couple other insurance issues, but nowhere near the magnitude of insurance issues that we've seen in prior years. Um, we did see a couple bills passed with regards to the health information exchange. Uh, and actually this is somewhat exciting. Uh, because I think it allows for additional opportunities for us to have an independent nonprofit manage data that's not an insurance company, and that's great for us. Uh, and in fact, there was a resolution that relates to one of these specific um, uh, pieces of legislation that came before the Medchi House of Delegates. Uh, the biggest thing is is that uh, it really uh, the, really uh, puts additional rules and regulations. Around the management of um, the management of uh, the data that comes into CRISP through the Health Information Exchange, and requires um, everybody who's uh, collecting this type of data to include the data in CRISP. Um, so uh, the other thing that will come out of this uh, is probably work around provider directories uh, as we move forward. Uh, it is really important on these data issues to have an independent entity that is not tied to an insurance company or anyone else that is taking into consideration things like patient rights and, and, and issues like that that are really important. So the more we can move these type of data issues away from the insurers and into this independent entity, the better it is for physicians and patients. So let's move over to public health. And this was obviously a very busy year for public health and there was a lot of discussion around COVID, but there was also a lot of discussion around the issue of equity with everything that's going on in our country. And I spoke a little bit about the, create, the phase two or the new health equity zones, uh, the new health equity commission that's been created um, earlier. Uh, but I also wanna point out that there was uh, other legislation that passed regarding um, the requirements for implicit bias uh, training, uh, requirements for um, around health disparity, requirements on the Department of Health to collect new types of data around race and eth ethnicity. Uh, we were very involved in all of these discussions and they're all very important. Uh, and for those of you who aren't aware, MedCai has an ideas task force who is specifically working on these issues and figuring out how we can uh, address these inequities in healthcare. Um, one of the things too we've been pushing for is the reporting of this data across the board. Uh, one of the things in the past you would not see is MMR data that was necessarily broken down by race and ethnicity or COVID data originally was not broken down in that manner. And now more and more that's happening uh, and those rules are now in place. This is gonna continue to be a major issue um, for uh, uh, as we move forward, given everything that's gone on uh, as we deal with these issues. Uh, maternal mortality was also a major area of work and it somewhat relates to the equity issue as uh, when you look at what's going on with maternal mortality, uh, white rates for maternal mortality uh, are improving where uh, rates for uh, black Marylanders has got, have gotten significantly worse. And the General Assembly recognized that I think they also recognize that the numbers are getting worse for poor people as well. Uh, Senate Bill 923 uh, increased the eligibility for postpartum uh, coverage uh, from 60 days postpartum to 12 months. Uh, and that was a huge thing that ACOG uh, pushed very hard for, MEGHI supported as well. And that was a great uh, uh, result with regards to MMR. The other thing that happened was uh, there was a prenatal and infant care grant program that was funded uh, and passed uh, this year as well. 
there is a lot of work around maternal mortality going on. It is one of the four quality measures that was picked with regards to the waiver. Uh, the Maryland uh, waiver, the all-payer contract has specific public health quality measures, which are MMR and opioid, opioids, diabetes, um, and, and then there's uh, one related childhood asthma. Um, and those are new measures that were just approved. And some of that legislation that was passed somewhat matches it. Another area where a lot of time and attention was spent um, was around uh, behavioral health and addictions. Um, and there, there was uh, uh, major revisions to the behavioral health uh, um, crisis response grant program um, and that are positive and helpful. Um, and then the other thing that passed of interest this year that Meg Kai supported uh, was the decriminalization of drug paraphernalia and specifically needles, uh, which are used to inject drugs. Um, and obviously the theory here is not that we want to get in the middle of these kind of issues. It's just that you don't want drug addicts sharing a dirty needle and getting HIV or AIDS and adding another um, medical problem to the addiction problem they already have. Um, the other bill that passed with regards to behavioral health uh, was a requirement that the Maryland Department of Health include uh, mental health, uh, include mental health uh, first aid among the behavioral health services that they provide to eligible veterans, which was another uh, positive uh, in the behavioral health space. So uh, a few public health measures um, that failed. Um, one uh, uh, that unfortunately uh, was the idea of creating overdose and infection disease prevention service programs or safe needle sites. Uh, maybe I shouldn't use that phrase, um, uh, but it's the idea of finding places where people can go and use their drugs they purchase in another place and a place where they can do it safely and get counseling and get help. And maybe again, we try to address these types of issues more as public health issues and less as criminal issues, but that bill did not pass. Uh, and then a bill that we were somewhat happy, I think it didn't make it, um, which would have uh, required uh, prescribers who prescribe or dispense opioid dosages of 50 morphine milligrams uh, to notify the PDMP as to whether they've received education on the risk associated with opioid use um, and several other things. And it just put another burden on practitioners. Uh, we think these are important issues and we wanna work on it, but we think there are better ways to do it. And, we're going to try to figure that out as we move forward, uh, going forward. Um, Meg Kai uh, opposed two bills that failed also, which would have changed emergency petitions. Um, one would have allowed uh, for uh, involuntary admission and petitions for emergency evaluations for substance use disorder. And then another one uh, would have uh, allowed healthcare practitioners to begin an evaluee under emergency petition to a healthcare facility rather than a peace officer. Um, and legislators were very concerned about the safety of hospital employees if a peace order wasn't in place. So uh, these whole, all these issues around involuntary admission obviously are very stressful and, and, um, and difficult uh, and, and they're much more complicated. And a lot of times people will hear a story or an anecdote and wanna change the whole framework in the statute. Uh, and usually it's a lot more complicated than, than that. Um, Another area where our public health agenda did not fare well, MedKai has always strongly supported um, uh, restrictions on tobacco. Uh, and we did support several bills that would have uh, regulated uh, and put increased regulations on um, vaping and uh, other flavored tobacco products. Uh, all of those uh, pieces of legislation failed and, uh, and did not get a vote. So um, that was disappointing. Uh, I don't know what the likelihood that they're gonna pass next year uh, in the final year before an election. So that's kind of a overview, very quick summary. We have a multi-page report from our lobbyists that goes into more detail on more bills. Um, I do wanna say that the reason that we are successful, and if you really think about it in summary, we got 92 million new dollars in Medicaid we killed the podiatry bill. We were part of a part of a broad-based coalition that um, that passed that telehealth bill that allows for audio calls and payment for RPM for other entities besides Medicare. We uh, got the Care First bill withdrawn. If you think about those four things alone, those are huge accomplishments. 
The reason we're able to do that is because of your involvement and your membership and you helping out and your phone calls and emails and we send them out. So um, we need you to stay involved, stay engaged and watch what we're doing. Um, we will send out these slides after uh, both uh, Dr. Pryor's slides on what we did during COVID and my slides on the legislative update. Um, and if you want more information on any bill, you can always reach out, but I will go ahead and open it up now for questions, comments, or concerns about anything. All right, Dr. Rockhauer, you want to go? Of course, you know what I'm going to say. Um, you know, we've talked about all the good things that, that get done in the legislature because of MedKai's efforts. But what everybody needs to do is support our efforts at the uh, double MPAC, the Maryland Medical Political Action Committee. If you get out your uh, on your computer and go to medpac.org, and I will put that into the chat, uh, you can contribute, and uh, that will certainly help us and help our uh, our uh, lobbyists do the things that we need to get done. All right, I am. I have additional hands raised here. Uh, Dr. Arjawat. Uh, well, first of all, congratulations to everybody involved. That was a great thing, especially the telemedicine, really. Uh, that was something we must cherish. And if we can continue beyond two years, that'll be great. If it becomes permanent, audio only, that'll be very beneficial to people who don't have access to you know, all these technology and many of my patients don't. So I love that. Number two, Gene, uh, the diversity, uh, you know, or the disparities in healthcare about the maternal mortality you were talking. I was feeling that there was something uh, going on with the federal government about the uh, MOMA Awareness Act, as they call it, mother and offspring mor 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 morbidity and mortality awareness. That was an act which was supposed to go and that will be able to fund the Medicaid in different states because 33% of the deliveries in the state of Maryland are through the Medicaid. And if you are going to extend the postpartum period to one year, you will need a lot of money. So I, can you just uh, shine some light on that? Yeah, let me, I'll take your first question first and I'll, I'll talk about the telehealth. So I think the big thing on telehealth, and, and one of the things I do want to point out, I really got to give a lot of credit to the behavioral health community who did a good job making sure they were included and covered in that bill. And it really was a lot of groups involved. It was really a team effort to get that bill passed where a lot of folks worked on it. It wasn't just MedKai. That one was one where the hospitals were involved, the behavioral health community, Ellen Weber, a lot of people did a lot of good work. But uh, on that, um, we do have a two-year report in the sunset. And it's gonna be really important that um, we don't have people who are complete pigs for lack of a better term. We can't have doctors who decide I'm having a bad month. So I'm just gonna go use the audio provision and call everybody I can to make some extra money because there's gonna be reports on what gets done. So I think that's important. The second thing in that bill, and this has not happened in other states, it pays for RPM, a remote patient monitoring. I think that's a really big public health opportunity and MedKai can help people if they wanna learn more about it. I know Dr. Posner, who I see is on, is doing remote patient monitoring. It's a really good way to manage complex patients like who have diabetes or heart conditions and keep them out of the hospital, which is a really big positive public health thing. So I just want to make those points on your first comment. On your second comment, that was part of the key. Uh, you're absolutely right about the federal money. And that was one of the keys to how they were able to do that. If you look in the slide deck, I have the price point on that postpartum. It is very expensive. And part of the key was they were able to maximize those federal dollars in the match with the state dollars to make that work. The other thing that's going on, because we have made, and, and MedKai pushed for this, MMR, one of the quality measures in, in the waiver, you now have access to possibly additional funding through the Health Services Cost Review Commission. Um, and there will be a greater attention because the hospitals will be afraid that they'll get a bad score on MMR and they'll lose their waiver. So that's kind of the strategy. Uh, I, I've got to say, this is an issue that, and I've worked for MedKai, it'll be 25 years in September. Um, this is something we have worked on since the day I started here. And I really have to commend Dr. Clark Johnson and Dr. Bob Atlas. Uh, Dr. Atlas is from Mercy and Dr. Johnson 
is from Hopkins. They have done a great job with that MMR committee and working on that. And we were working on that before it was even popular. The state didn't actually take over the reporting stuff until the, around 2000. So um, we've really kind of been a leader on that and we're gonna continue to be a leader on that issue. Uh, and it, it's just, the numbers are uh, disappointing at best when you see them. And there clearly is an inequity and it's a major problem. And I think your comments were absolutely right, Dr. Arjulai. Thank you. All right, Dr. Edwards, you have your hand up. Thank you, Jean. Great report and I appreciate our president's presentation on COVID. My question was, I need you to clarify for me a little bit, please. This issue of care first, trying to get the doctors to take on responsibility, um, what's, what's the logic in that request? And I, I gave you a little analogy and I'm like, how could that happen? You wouldn't ask a mechanic and um, the auto industry to go in together on the cost of repairs. Well, what, what are we saying here with the doctors and the insurance companies? So, so okay. let me, I'm going to try to pretend that I'm not the CEO of Medchi for a second and try to give you their argument first. Thank this you. is what Brian Pinnock would say. Brian Pinnock would say value-based care is being used all over the country. Most countries allow us to enter into these value-based care contracts where doctors can take risks. Uh, most states allowed us to do this. We can't do this here in Maryland because of this unique prohibition. And all we're asking is to do the same amount of risk as the federal government and some of the other programs uh, like that they're running, like CPC Plus and other programs like that. Um, so that's what they would say. Um, our position is exactly yours, that, that you cannot ask physicians to take risks. And, and even to that point, I think there's a difference between a large air, entity like a MedStar taking risk, who is in a different position and different ability to take risk, and someone like you who's in a two member primary care practice taking risks. And, and frankly, there's a kind of a continuum and we have to have protections and checks and balances. And does it make sense for us to incentivize people on doing the right thing with regards to you know, population health and managing high risk patients? Yes, I think we're okay with that. What we don't wanna do is create a situation where people are put uh, in an untenable situation. They take so much risk, they go bankrupt. I would even argue this is a big deal, not just for small practices. I think it's a big deal for small hospitals too. Um, I think the smaller community hospitals that are left and even maybe the smaller systems, you know, the, 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 the what do they call it? Luminous or tide, tidal over on the Eastern shore that I think it's a big deal for them too because they can't take a major hit either. Uh, and even a mid-size to what we would consider a larger practice might not be able to manage it. So we want to have a real discussion about real checks and balances that are put in place. And that was why we asked, we opposed the legislation and we asked for the hold. If you're interested in this, I would strongly urge, and I see a few people on this, and I would say it doesn't just apply to primary care. This is all specialties they're talking about. And in fact, I can tell you, they wanna start with cardiology, orthopedics, uh, and GI. Those are the three they're focused on to start with. Um, so this is what I've heard anecdotally from people at Care First. So, I would just say that if you're interested, we have a task force that the board has set up, Dr. Pryor and the other presidents have set up to deal with this. Uh, and we are talking with them um, and we're gonna work on this issue and move forward. So that's kind of the game plan. All right, Dr. Olson. And I wanna, Dr. Olson is the, the uh, new chair of the opioid committee. So thank you for taking that on Dr. Olson. Go ahead. Sure, thank you. and. Um, I had a question and I also just wanted to respond, I guess, to Dr. Edwards um, and to your, uh, Jean, your um, really insightful response around um, kind of the value-based purchase or value-based payments. Um, you know, I think in behavioral health, uh, you know, as an addiction medicine specialist, I mean, I see patients who are unbelievably complicated, but, and there's a lot I can do, but there's so many different pieces to their overall health that all those social determinants of health that I have no control over. Um, and, you know, people who are homeless, people who are, um, you know, have uh, food insecurity, people, all those things, you know, as a, as, as a small provider, really thinking about, you know, kind of having to take on risk um, and, having, and figuring out 
you know, kind of how to manage all of those components, that just, it, it really terrifies me. Um, even though I am a, you know, proponent of value-based um, payments and figuring out how to do that well, but I absolutely agree with you that there have to be checks and balances and there has to be some understanding that patient, patient populations are not homogeneous um, and you know, that we really need to take that into account. So um, that's just kind of number one. Um, and then number two, um, I, um, my question was, um, of course now I forgot what my question was. Uh, Yeah, now, now I think I forgot what my question was, but it will come back to me. <laughs> well, that was a good comment. <laughs> anyway, yes, <yeah. laughs> so we'll give you credit for that one. And one of the other points on the value-based care that I want to make is remember that the State Insurance Commission doesn't have authority over ERISA plans. So if we give them too much authority, there's got to be somewhere where we can go that's not complicated. Because going to Washington to try to get uh, some type of fairness is not easy. It's complicated. And I just, that's why we really have to be cautious as we work through this thing and do it right. Uh, do you, my, oh. oh, go ahead. Why don't we let Dr. Olson ask her question and we'll come to you, Dr. Arjawat. Yeah, I remember my question. Thanks. Oh. Um, so I, uh, I was actually wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the diversity task force at MedKai. Um, and, uh, you know, if we're interested, who to contact, um, uh, et cetera. Well, I'll tell you what, if you're interested, we'll, we'll, I'll, I'll, Kathy Johannesson is the main staff person for it. It's called the Ideas Task Force. Um, I don't know, Dr. Pryor, do you want to answer this? I know you were president-elect when it was set up, when Dr. Manahan did it. You want to explain it? Sure. Um, as you know, this has become a, a significant issue in the conversation in America on a larger scale. And so setting this up made a lot of sense to look at health equity and socioeconomic determinants of health and all of these issues. Um, I would direct you, I think, for specifics regarding some of the uh, recommendations and policy that has arisen from the work of the group already, um, I would direct you to the, um, our House of Delegates upcoming on Sunday morning. On our website, there is a report from the IDEA Task Force um, documenting some of the work that has been done up to this point. They do continue to meet regularly. So we welcome anybody who wants to get more involved with the IDEA Task Force. And I would absolutely either reach out to Kathy um, if you have her information. If not, if you wanna put it in the chat, I'm sure we can get that information over to her. And we welcome anybody who wants to be an active participant on that task force. Yeah, and, and one of the things, Dr. Manahan has been very involved in it, and she's been one of the point people, and we have others as well. Uh, one of the um, things they've done is get some really great speakers. In fact, at our House of Delegates meeting this Sunday, the two speakers, um, I believe, were identified by the Ideas Task Force for that meeting, if I recall correctly. Um, and obviously, this is, they've also put forth several resolutions and suggested that we work on AMA policy and helped us frame our legislative agenda. Interestingly, Dr. Manahan did this as part of her kind of run for president, and it was prior to the George Floyd murder. So um, it was the timing was oddly perfect, given what was going on in America at the time. So it is something we've been working on for a while. It's a great group. And I mean, they have really good attendance and they're, they're very robust meetings. So great. Thank you. I'll yeah. connect you with Kathy Johannesson and we'll get okay. you the info. And if you know other people who want to be involved, we we want it to be inclusive and open and, and go from there. Yeah, yeah, there may very well be some um, addiction yeah. medicine folks that are um, really interested. Um, I mean, clearly, it's been an issue in addiction. Um, and behavioral health in general, but, um, but I think having some, you know, an organized um, entity to kind of plug into would be great. Thank you. One, one of the other issues, too, in that whole space is on the health equity issue, there was a big fight about where the money went. And, and, uh, and there was, in the original legislation, there was language that said only the original folks who got health enterprise zones could apply. And that was a big concern to us, and it's more open now. So the other thing is if you're interested in equity or diversity, reaching out to us and having us put your name forward to try to be on that advisory council. Now look, there's very few seats and there's three by the speaker, three by the president, three by the governor. If 
but we're looking for some names because I, what we don't want to have is a situation where all the money goes to very, very large entities. Because I do think there are probably some local community-based organizations and FQHCs and maybe even local county medical societies who might have really good ideas about grants that need to get a fair shot. And I'm, I'm hoping we can get a doctor or two in the mix of nine to be on there. So it's not just all ending up with very large entities, if you know what I'm saying. So, um, any other questions? Do we have any other hands up? I, Dr. Arjawat, did you want to have a second round? Uh, just wanted to ask you the question about what uh, Care First was putting forward, because as you know, more than 30% of uh, the clientele is ERISA plan, to my understanding. And that creates a lot of trouble. That's uh, my comment on that. Number two is that the work uh, Metka is doing on idea, the inclusion, diversity, and empowerment. And the most important part in that is advocacy. And we need to be advocating for this health you know, disparities, what is happening and diversity to be having. So I think many people should join that and they can also help into advocating on the whole concept around. That's my comment. Those are both great comments. <laughs> um, anything else for the good of the order? Any other questions? Dr. Advocating, in, advocating in Annapolis, medicalpack.org. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Dr. Pryor, did you want to did you want to make some closing comments? Well, um, I appreciate the lively conversation that we've had. Um, I appreciate your taking your time. And again, uh, Dr. Rockauer is absolutely right. Medkai can't do this without the support of everyone. And I would add to that, we would also like the engagement of everyone. Now that our meetings have gone virtual, this is an opportunity for people who would normally have to travel to Baltimore to get involved. This is an opportunity to jump in and get involved virtually from the safety and comfort of your own home. And we absolutely can use your input and your engagement, not only with our advocacy efforts, but also with one of our committees, council subcommittees, if you wanna know what's going on legislatively before the session closes, then join our legislative committee and get involved. Um, so it's, it's a call for involvement and for maintaining your membership and for talking to your colleagues about the value of what MedKai does and why it's so important for all of our physician practices, regardless of the modality, why it's so important to be there, engaged, communicating and belonging to MedKai. And, and Dr. Money, I saw your comment in the chat, which I, I, we have heard other stories of other issues like that, but that's very helpful. Maybe, maybe we can get you involved in that Care First Task Force because I think it's helpful for people who've had experiences like that. Okay. Thanks. All right. Thanks, well, thank everybody. You, everybody, that was great. Good thank seeing you. everyone. Good night. Good night. And we'll get you your CME email out so you can get your credit. Perfect. Thanks. Thank you all very much. Take care. Thanks so much.